Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Up next is Amarok Weiss. She's with the Center for Biological Diversity, and she's going to be talking about the wolves in the Northwest and a few other things. Please enjoy her presentation. There will be a live Q&A following. The Petaluma Valley, in what is now called California, was once teeming with enormous herds of deer and elk. Groves of valley oak and black oak thick with acorns blanketed the landscape. The Petaluma River wound its way through the valley, meandering south to a mighty bay and then on to the ocean. The river was a major flyway for ducks and geese and flocks so dense they blackened the skies, blocking the sun for an hour at a time. But the river and the surrounding valley also welcomed swarms of brilliant orange and black migrating monarch butterflies. And California condors soared the thermals, their 10-foot wingspans powerfully arcing over the land 10,000 feet below. And in the midst of all this, on a sloped ridge, or Petaluma, from the Coast Miwok language, Coyote sat down to have a conversation with Chicken Hawk. And in their conversation, they created the humans who became the Laketuit Nation, who lived in the Petaluma region for thousands of years until the Spaniards arrived. The Spanish brought with them deadly European diseases which ravaged the Laketuit people, livestock which forced out the native deer and elk, and invasive plants which replaced the native sedges and bunch grasses. The Laketuit way of life was destroyed. And these Spanish settlers have long been celebrated and written about in history books and statues erected in their honor. This is where I live in California, the land of the Petalumans of the Laketuit nation. Just to the south this summer, a monument of Father Sarah was toppled. The last known wolf in California was killed in 1924. The last known wolf in Oregon was killed and brought in for a bounty payment in 1947. And in Washington, after 1915 or so, the state's once bountiful wolf population was reduced to occasional sightings of lone wolves, or at most two or three wolves together. And across the rest of the country, wolves were similarly exterminated and most were gone by the early 1930s. It took another 40 plus years to get wolves listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1974. 20 years after their listing, wolves were restored to Yellowstone and central Idaho. 20 years later, after those reintroductions, wolves made it from Idaho to Oregon and Washington and then on to California. And all of these accomplishments and upheavals happened because people made it happen. People like the Murrays who studied wolves in Alaska and whose published research informed how wolves live and that they need not be feared. People like Canadian biologist Douglas Pimlot, who wrote an article in 1967 proposing that wolves be restored to Yellowstone. Former Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt and former Director of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Molly Beatty, both of whom championed the reintroduction of wolves to the Northern Rockies. Then there were people like Renee Askins, who established the Wolf Fund to popularize wolf recovery and bring wolf education to the public. People like the capture and reintroduction team of Mike Phillips, Doug Smith, Carter Niemeyer, Dave Meach, Ed Bangs, Joe Fontaine, Mark Johnson, and others the multiple conservation organizations who filed lawsuits and who joined in lawsuits to keep the momentum going and see the process through to the end. And the members and supporters of conservation organizations like you, who contacted your congressional representatives and agency policymakers to show your overwhelming support for wolf recovery. All of these people made it happen. This is history. These are stories that are thrilling and exciting and often tragic that make the heart race, that give you the energy and the confidence to fight for the future. Because we are here to create future stories that will be celebrated at future conferences. 
The West Coast, from Southeast Alaska to California, has been the field of many battles and many successes. The Alexander Archipelago wolf is a rare subspecies of gray wolf, Canis lupus lygoni. This wolf subspecies is found on the southeastern Alaska mainland and also on some islands off the Alexander Archipelago, which is a network of more than 1,000 islands off the mainland. This region is also home to the Tongass National Forest, which is the largest designated national forest in North America. It has some of the largest remaining stands of old growth temperate rainforest in the world. It consists of 17 million acres and it includes 19 designated wilderness areas. And 80% of the Alexander Archipelago wolf's habitat is within the boundaries of the Tongass National Forest, which are all the areas in green on this map. Prince of Wales Island in the archipelago supports a substantial portion of this wolf population. This region of coastal Southeast Alaska also is the ancestral home of First Nations and has been for thousands of years for the Tlingit, Haida, and Sinchian. Alexander Archipelago wolves are exquisitely beautiful, don't you think? Noticeably smaller than the typical wolf, on average they weigh only 30 to 50 pounds. They also have a denser and darker coat. It's typically black or a very dark gray. These wolves require dense, undeveloped forest with an abundance of wildlife for food sources. Old growth forest is also critical to providing appropriate denning sites because these wolves make their dens in the roots of old growth trees. Their primary prey is Sitka black-tailed deer and a very significant threat to the wolf's continued survival may be the lack of a sustainable food source because these deer are themselves in decline thanks to large-scale clear-cutting of old-growth forests. In Southeast Alaska and on the mainland, and on Prince of Wales Island and the other nearby islands, these wolves are really unique because they're significantly different from other gray wolves. They're smaller, they're darker in color, they have a unique diet component because they eat a lot of salmon in the fall, and they're genetically distinct. Also, they occupy a unique ecological habitat, the coastal rainforest. What has happened here is the typical pattern that happens of the forces of the logging industry, corporate interests, hunting and politicians, and the indifference, failure, complicity, and corruption of the active state and federal wildlife agencies in the region. On Prince of Wales Island, in 1994, the wolf population was 336. By 2014, it had diminished to 89. 2016, it was back up to 231, and by 2018, it had declined again to 170. The population increased between 2014 and 2016 only because, due to those low numbers in 2014, a wolf habitat management program was jointly created by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. This wolf habitat management program contained elements that were designed to conserve the wolves there. And one really key element ensured that quotas would be in place so that even though wolf hunting and trapping was allowed, the quotas had to be set sufficiently low to ensure the continued existence of a sustainable wolf population. In addition to this joint management plan, the federal management plan for the Tongass National Forest itself directs the U.S. Forest Service to assist in managing legal and illegal wolf mortality rates to within sustainable levels. Nevertheless, in the 2019-2020 trapping season, 165 of the estimated 170 wolves on Prince of Wales Island were killed through trapping because this joint state and federal management program and the directives in the Tongass National Forest Plan were completely ignored. Let me say that again. 165 out of 170 wolves were killed. The state of Alaska had removed all quotas for this island, and it stopped any monitoring during the trapping season to keep track of how many wolves were being killed. And the U.S. Forest Service did nothing to intervene. 
Going back at least 20 years, there have been massive battles by environmental groups and First Nations to protect the old growth forests here, to protect the wolves, and to maintain other federal laws that protect this special place from constant assaults. For example, there have been efforts by past administrations to remove the Tongass National Forest from the protections of the roadless rule and victorious court battles to stop those efforts. The roadless rule is a landmark conservation rule adopted by Congress in 2001 to protect nearly 60 million acres of wild national forests and grasslands across the United States from new road building and logging. There also have been administrative petitions and legal challenges filed in an attempt to get the Alexander Archipelago wolf listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act in 2011 and 2015. And of course, under the Trump administration, there have been ongoing efforts to eliminate any and all protections here. In 2019, the Trump administration worsened the threat with the proposed plan it issued last October to eliminate long-standing roadless protections on 9 million undeveloped acres of the Tongass. In 2020, even before the roadless rule decision has been made, in September, just this month, the Trump administration issued plans for a massive timber sale that would destroy more than 5,100 acres of old growth forest here. Now this map shows where logging already is taking place and where additional logging would occur if the Trump administration goes forward with its plan. You can see the areas marked in black is where logging has already taken place. And all of the areas with the yellow cross patch over the green is where all the new logging would take place. You can see this is a substantial amount of this wolf's habitat. This summer, the Center for Biological Diversity, Alaska Rainforest Defenders, and Defenders of Wildlife petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service again to give Endangered Species Act protections to the Alexander Archipelago wolf. We're asking them to protect these wolves in Southeast Alaska as a distinct population segment of the species. And we hope that that will be a future story of success for wolves. Now, moving down the coast to Washington, Oregon, and California, like the rest of the country, the last wolves in these coastal states were largely exterminated by the 1930s. Today, there are between 108 and 145 wolves in Washington, in Oregon, around 158, and in California, a known 14 wolves. How did we get here? Wolves started to return to the West Coast in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and three key factors made this possible. First, the reintroduction of wolves to central Idaho and Yellowstone National Park in 1995 and 96 resulted in packs establishing there. And a few generations later, some of Idaho's wolves started to head west to Oregon and Washington. A decade after that, Oregon's wolves began to disperse into California. Second, in all three West Coast states, wolves were federally protected. So any wolves dispersing there were automatically protected. And third, Wolves coming into Oregon and Washington were already protected by their own state endangered species acts. And after wolves came to California, the center and allies got wolves protected under California law as well. Each of these three states has begun to develop a wolf population, though wolf recovery is far from sufficient at this time. But in 2011, Congress stripped wolves of federal protections in the eastern one third of Oregon and the eastern one third of Washington. In 2015, Oregon stripped wolves of state protections, and in Washington, their State Endangered Species Act is very weak on protections. And what this all means is that in both Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington, the state wildlife agencies can and do kill wolves for conflicts with livestock. Let's start with Washington. It's a stunningly beautiful state of mountains and rivers and valleys, and it's filled with hikers and skiers and wildlife viewers. And we're close to 70% of the population strongly supports the return of wolves. The state's wildlife agency, however, conducts its business as if 70% of the population wanted wolves killed and exterminated. Washington's first wolf pack was confirmed in 2008, and in 2011, the state adopted a wolf conservation and management plan. But then the state wildlife agency took wolf management away from its endangered species staff and turned it over to its game management staff. 
Sometimes duplicity hides its face. Sometimes it is in plain view. Right after that, Wolf's lost federal protections in Eastern Washington. Since then, the state has been ignoring key science and principles in the state wolf plan, killing wolves and wiping out entire packs. Since 2012, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has killed 34 state endangered wolves on behalf of private for-profit livestock operators. 90% of the wolves killed were killed for conflicts on public lands. 85% of the wolves killed were killed for the same ranching operation, which fails to adequately watch over its cattle. Most of the killing has occurred in the northeast corner of the state, where, as you can see from this map, is where most of Washington's wolves live. Wolf management in Washington is repeatedly a losing proposition for the wolves because the state agency places a higher value on the desires of the livestock industry than the interests and needs of wolves, even though wolves are designated as a state endangered species and are still in the early age stages of recovery in Washington. To implement its state wolf plan, the agency created a wolf advisory group, or WAG for short, which is composed of private citizens but the WAG is heavily weighted with ranching and hunting interests. In early August, the agency removed from the WAG an individual who is the best representative of the vast majority of people who live in Washington who want to see wolves protected. They kicked him off the WAG because he dissented. It's the epitome of dishonesty and corruption by the government. Washington has no rules requiring livestock operators in wolf country to use protective measures to deter conflicts with wolves. And the state wildlife agency won't require them to either. For the past four years, the state agency has relied on the WAG to craft a protocol of how to address livestock wolf conflicts. But the protocol contains no actual requirements of livestock operators. It also isn't enforceable. So the agency is free to do whatever it wants, and it does. There are innumerable examples. The most egregious is that of the 34 wolves the agency has killed, 29 were killed for the one particular livestock operation, which simply won't take adequate steps to protect its livestock. And it can't even find dead or injured livestock until days after conflicts occurred because this operation doesn't keep track of where its livestock are. So here we have this magnificent state with overwhelming public support for wolves, yet the whole field of wolf management here is a mess. We have filed lawsuits. We have filed administrative petitions to get enforceable rules in place. The governor has weighed in. Last fall, Governor Inslee wrote the agency to say that the annual killing of wolves in Northeast Washington is simply unacceptable. He told the agency it must come up with new solutions. Irrespective, the state agency has been defiant. Governor Inslee's directive continued with its old methods, continued to kill wolves this year. We believe a solution lies in these three actions. First, wolf management in Washington, specifically how the state addresses livestock wolf conflicts, must go through a public rulemaking process to create transparent rules which are enforceable which require livestock operators and agency staff to use non-lethal measures to prevent conflict. A rulemaking process would also mean that whatever management options are arrived at will have gone through a full scientific assessment. And I have excellent news to report. This summer, in May, my organization and three allies filed an administrative petition with the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission, urging it to start a rulemaking petition. In late June, the commission denied our petition, so we filed an appeal with the governor. And on September 4th, Governor Inslee came through for wolves. He granted our appeal and he directed the commission to commence rulemaking. This is a testament to all the pressure that has come from conservation organizations and members of the public like all of you. The multiple lawsuits filed against the state, the newspaper ads and billboards, and the fact that the state agency thumbed its nose at the governor last year when he told them they needed to change how they were managing wolves. And in a nod to his understanding that residents of the West Coast will not abide by wolves being managed as they have been in the Northern Rockies, in his letter to the commission reversing their decision, Inslee specifically pointed to the Northern Rockies wolf management and said, we can and we must do better than that. 
Number two, an equally important component of the solutions is that the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission, which oversees the state agency, must be reformed so that people holding those seats have the science background necessary to be making decisions that are critical about fish and wildlife in the state. That means filling current vacancies on a commission with qualified candidates and replacing commission members when their terms are up. And my organization and others are working together right now to identify suitable candidates to put forward for the governor's consideration. Finally, we need total reform of the commission and the agency and of the chief funding source for the agency. That's how you stop the ability of political influence in shaping their decisions, such as the influence that's exerted by the livestock and sports hunting industries. Washington is a mess, but I can tell you the desire, the energy and the passion of the groups fighting back is inexhaustible. And in this recent win with the governor ordering the commission to create enforceable rules, this shows why we must never give up. Moving on to Oregon. Like Washington, Oregon's first wolf pack was confirmed in 2008. And Oregon also crafted a state wolf conservation and management plan, but it did so quite early in 2005, even before its first pack was confirmed. In the beginning of wolf management in Oregon, the state wildlife agency was ignoring its wolf plan and rushing to kill wolves too quickly. So the center and allies sued the state. And the result was much stronger protections and enforceable requirements of the state agency and livestock operators to use non-lethal measures before wolves could be killed. The agency has increased emphasis on non-lethal measures and it's hired more staff to teach those methods to livestock operators. This seems to be paying off. Last year, even though Oregon's wolf population grew by 15%, conflicts with livestock went down 43%, and the agency did not kill any wolves. Lest you think that a 15% annual population growth, though, means that Oregon has lots of wolves, or that the wolf population here is recovered, here's a really important fact to know. Scientists who've done modeling studies of suitable wolf habitat in Oregon conclude that the state could support up to 1,420 wolves. That means that wolf recovery in Oregon is still in its early stages. With an estimated current population of 158 wolves, that's only a little more than 10% of what the state could support. Greater numbers are definitely necessary to maintain genetic diversity and to restore wolves to their ecological function. And where wolves are residing tells the other part of that story. This map shows where Oregon's wolf packs currently reside. But there's close to 10 times the amount of suitable habitat that wolves are not occupying yet. And on the good news end of things, most of Oregon's packs are in the Northeast portion, but there finally are three known packs in Western Oregon, the Rogue, White River, and Indigo packs. Last year, Oregon adopted revisions to its wolf plan, which opened the door to wolf hunting and trapping. Now let's turn our attention to our last subject of this talk, California. As many of you know, an Oregon born wolf called OR7 was the first known wolf to enter California in nearly 90 years. Born in 2009, he left his birthplace in Northeastern Oregon as a young adult in the fall of 2011, crossed the state of Oregon and then kept on going into California. His timing was impeccable. He crossed into California on December 28th of 2011, 38 years to the day that the Endangered Species Act was passed. OR7 eventually returned to Southwest Oregon where he met a mate, formed the rogue pack, and sired pups five years in a row in 2014 through 2018. Several other Oregon wolves have come to California, including at least three of OR7's pups. This spring, the Oregon Wildlife Agency announced that OR7 had likely died. He's not been seen with his pack since last October, and he would have turned 11 this spring, which is ancient for a wolf. He lived a long and celebrated life, and he left an indelible legacy for wolf recovery in both Oregon and California. California, like Washington and Oregon, also developed a state wolf plan and modeling studies were used to identify suitable wolf habitat in California. 
This map shows in gray all the great wolf habitat identified. It's around 26,000 square miles. And wolves that have dispersed into California and spent any time there have ground truth to that map. Many have traveled in some of those places exactly. Two confirmed wolf packs have established in California. The Shasta Pack was the first, and the existence of this stunningly beautiful, all black coated seven member wolf family was confirmed in late summer of 2015 in Siskiyou County, in Northeastern California. But the pack mysteriously disappeared a few months later after being implicated in livestock conflicts. California's second and only currently existing pack is the Lassen Pack, which ranges across Lassen and Plymouth counties in this area in yellow on the map to the right. Confirmed in 2017, the pack's original breeding male was a son of OR7. He was born into OR7's first litter in 2014, and he came to California a few years later. The breeding female of the Lassen Pack traveled to California from the Northern Rockies. The two met up in California and they had pups together three years in a row, 2017 through 2019. Additional wolves have come to California. Counting the Lassen Pack's new pups this year, I know of 37 different wolves who since 2011 came into California and stayed, came into California and left or were born here. One who came to California and stayed is OR54, a daughter of OR7. Born into his 2016 litter, OR54 entered California in January 2018 and stayed for two years. She ranged widely in search of a mate, covering nearly 9,000 miles. Tragically, in February, she was found dead, but the cause has not yet been revealed by agency officials. Today, there are 14 known wolves in California, at least, and that is the Lassen Pack, which now consists of two adults, four sub-adults from last year's litter, and at least eight new pups born this year. The pack's original breeding male, who was gray in color, disappeared last year in June of 2019, just a few months after that year's litter was born. But a new male, a black furred wolf of unknown origin, a man of mystery, if you will, began to be seen hanging out with the remainder of the pack. This year in 2020, that new adult male has been confirmed to be the Lassen Pack's breeding male. And he and the female had their first litter together this year, producing at least eight bouncing, adorable pups. Now, obviously, wolves are extremely new in California. There's only a few here at present, but California has the most protective state laws in the country. It has the highest level of support for wolf recovery in the country, and it has the best political landscape for wolves in the country. I'm going to wrap up this discussion of California's wolves with this short trail crown video clip of California's newest wolf residents, the Lassen pups, taken in July when these pups were just a few months old. Before we go into question and answer, I'm anticipating that many of you will want to know who you can write to or call or what action alerts we have up right now for protecting all these wolves that I've discussed. Since my talk is being pre-recorded in September and there will undoubtedly be new developments for wolves happening between now and November when the conference takes place, I'm going to notify conference organizers in November of the most current alerts so that they can post links for those during this conference between sessions or in the chat box. And now I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, be right back. Okay. Hi, I'm Rook. How are you? I'm doing great today. How are you? Good, good. And there's Caroline. Yay, Caroline, our Apex volunteer who's going to be uh, doing sign for all of this uh, wonderful Q&A we have with you. What an incredible presentation. Lots of comments. First of all, complimenting you on what a worry you are, warrior you are for wolves. So 
And uh, I'm also a great admirer. So thank you again for participating in Sedona Wolf Week. Uh, this is a village effort. I can't do my work without all the people out there who support wolves. And so this is a, a joint venture. We're baking a cake together to save wolves. Yes, absolutely. It does take a village. So I've got some questions already coming in. And these, this one first one starts with Washington wolves. Okay. And it's, it's, so it's got a couple of parts to it. So for all that Governor Inslee advocates for climate change, how is it that he doesn't realize the connection between climate change, ecosystems, and biodiversity? How can you support one and not the other? So this is where politics comes in. I have absolutely no doubt that Governor Inslee totally understands that connection. He probably understands that connection more than most people who are in positions of governance in this country. But when you are a governor, you have to pick and choose your battles. And if what your major item is coming in requires the support of not only Democrats, but also Republicans, then you are very unlikely to tackle other issues that will be extremely unpopular with Republicans because you will then lose their votes on the issue that you have made your major political stand on uh, as to what you're going to accomplish as a governor. And I believe that Governor Inslee found himself in a position where if he was actively supporting wolves earlier in his administration, he would have lost whatever Republican support he would have needed in the state legislature or any of his climate change agenda. Uh, he certainly, uh, coming towards the end of his, his uh, most recent term, found it within himself that the public pressure coming at him, and again, this is kudos to all of you, you Wolf Village out there for putting unending pressure on the governor by signing petitions, writing letters, calling his office, um, same thing with the director and, and the commission, but really the pressure on the governor with all of those measures, the billboards that went up, the full page and quarter page ads in the Seattle Times got his attention to the point where even though he was still at the end of his last term and still facing a, a race to be reelected, he developed the, the political courage to make the statement that he did and the letter that he sent to the agency last year directing them that they have to do something different. Some people commented to me that um, that action was insufficient, that the Wolf Advisory Group is still taking actions that are harmful towards wolves. And I think folks may not realize that he took a much bolder step this year. And I talk about that in, in the talk that you just heard in yes. which he actually reversed the decision of the commission and told them they have to engage in rulemaking. They have to come up with enforceable, transparent rules that hold the agency and livestock operators accountable. So, um, you know, he's in his last term now. Uh, hopefully we will see him continue on that trajectory of strength for wolves. Absolutely. <laughs> Shifting gears a little bit, we have a question about the Alexander wolves. Um, it says, Based on a population of five, it seems genetic viability is extremely threatened. Are there, other, are there other populations that exist given these wolves are genetically distinct? So the numbers game in Southeast Alaska and Prince of Wales Island just got very interesting again more recently. So when they did the trapping season last year, it was based on their 2018 population estimate of 170 wolves. And you'll recall in my talk, I indicated that 165 of those wolves were killed. They recently um, revealed their 2019 population numbers, although they did it in a very uh, last minute fashion. The state and the federal agency is actually supposed to confer with regional councils who include subsistence hunters to get their input before the state agency decides on a hunting or trapping season and decides how long it will be or if there will be bag limits. And in this instance, they did have the 2019 figures, but they wouldn't release them to the regional subsistence council. Uh, there was a public meeting held October 29th 
The folks in the area were pushing for more wolf trapping and extended season. And in the end, the agency decided to give them that because the agency is now claiming that the 2019 wolf population is at, was at 316 animals. So that there weren't only five left, there were 316 animals left. And this is where it gets really um, difficult for the public to have faith in agency transparency. You know, we've seen in different states when wolves have been federally delisted, those states change their population monitoring methods. We've even seen that in Wisconsin while wolves are back on the federal list again, how the state has changed its monitoring. So I can't state that there's only five wolves left on Prince of Wales Island based on this new information. That certainly was the information um, that was released last year. I also can't state that I have confidence in the figure of 316 wolves. The sad news is that based on that level that they claim, they are now extending the hunting and trapping season there. They're going to have a full 21 day trapping season there. And they will also have a five day hunt. And the hunting season will allow a five wolf bag limit per hunter and the trapping season doesn't have quotas on it. There are two legal actions happening right now because of all of this. This summer, the center and several allies filed a legal petition with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service demanding that Alexander Archipelago wolves be listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act that would halt all hunting and trapping there. In addition, in October, the Alaska Wildlife Alliance filed a lawsuit against the state to try to stop the trapping and hunting there. Unfortunately, on Monday, the injunction that they requested uh, to halt any hunting and trapping while their lawsuit is pending, that injunction was denied by a judge. So their lawsuit is still alive and still has yet to be heard in court, but there is not a legal means at this moment in time to stop the hunting and trapping from going forward this season. We do expect the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to come back uh, with their 90-day finding in January as to whether or not they will list the wolf under the Endangered Species Act. Wow. I mean, I mean, you know, I feel fairly new to this whole world of wolf advocacy and just listening to you and it definitely is a marathon and it's hard to hold on to hope, truthfully, because um, it kind of seems like everything's stacked against wolves. Um, so I don't know how you do it day in and day out, but I'm really happy that you do. Um, you, know, you know how, Betsy, and, and I'll remind folks of this, <laughs> this is a marathon. You know, things that happen took time to happen. You know, from the time uh, wolves first were gone, it took until 1973 to pass an Endangered Species Act and get them on the act. And then after they were on the act, it took another 20 years to get wolves reintroduced to Yellowstone. And then after that, we started to see wolves starting to come over into the West Coast states. So these things do happen. They happen at a glacial pace. And, uh, but, but the other thing that happens that is explosive is how many more members of the public are sporting wolves now. When the service first tried to delist wolves back in 2003, they had opened a public comment period and they got 90,000 public comments, 95% of which opposed wolf delisting. We all were part of the campaign last year to save wolves when the public comment period was open last year on the new attempt to delist wolves. 1.8 million people submitted comments. That is a figure that tells you how much the trajectory towards justice is going to bend for the wolf and is continuing to bend in the direction of the wolf. It's, it's uneven, there are defeats and setbacks, but we advance. Absolutely. And just to touch on the delisting real quick is, I mean, I know your presentation is about, uh, is about the West, but um, we did put in the comments for anyone who's interested petitions from the Center of Biological Diversity and other action items that you can do to support the fight in uh, stopping the delisting gray wolves. 
Great, I'm so glad you have those so that people can see them. So uh, last week we did an emergency wolf delisting webinar for folks who want to see that. If you just go to YouTube and go to the Center for Biological Diversity YouTube channel, uh, look for the webinar that we did on wolf delisting November 5th. But um, at that event, we announced that what's going to be really important here is as wolves get federally delisted, they're going to be key states where we all need to be putting pressure on the governors to do our best to see that there are no wolf hunting or trapping seasons there, that there's no expansion of the use of killing wolves for livestock conflicts. And so uh, we have a petition uh, that you can go directly to the link that Betsy's provided there. You can sign that petition. Those will be sent to the governors and please share that petition with your friends and family. But in addition, we also have posted an, a wolf activist toolkit where we've provided information on how you can reach out to the specific governors that we think are of most concern. And we have some talking points there that you can include when you email them or call them. So please take action and please share that wolf activist toolkit too. Absolutely. And this may be a good segue and again, slightly off the topic of your presentation, but I think people like to hear your opinion. It's regarding Colorado um, and your perspective on the recent wolf reintroduction there. And how will things be different from Yellowstone's reintroduction and where will those wolves come from? And I know that that was a very close vote as well. You and, was I, <laughs> you and I were going back and forth all night. <laughs> we were, yeah, yeah. It's it's now up by five percent. It's now up by ten percent. Um, so yeah, and, and that's actually another case where what the poll showed didn't come out the same way in in, in the vote because uh, recent polls in Colorado had showed that eighty four percent of the public supported having wolves back, but um, I believe the ballot measure passed by 20,000 votes. So it was, it was really very, very close. Um, I do not know where they're planning to bring the wolves in from. I can tell you that my associate at the center, Mike Robinson, is deeply involved in the Colorado wolf efforts. And so I'm going to ask him, and I don't know if you um, have some opportunity here at the conference for us to like post answers afterwards to questions that we didn't know the exact answer to at the time. But if you do, I'll find out from Michael if he has some thoughts on that, you know, and how it's going to be different, you know, for folks who followed the Yellowstone book for introduction, one of the things you know is that there were soft releases in Yellowstone. You know, they built the acclimation pens at about an acre in size and kept the wolves in those pens for 10 weeks before they released them. Whereas in central Idaho, they did hard releases. They just transported the wolves down from Canada and released them into great wolf habitat in the wilderness, uh, the Pine Church River of No Return Wilderness. And so again, Michael may have some insights for me as to whether or not the agency has dived into how they're going to do that, if there's the acclimation pens or a hard release. But I would be happy to get those answers back to you if there's some way for you to share them with folks here at the conference. Absolutely. Uh, this live stream where everyone's watching you right now is accessible, uh, ongoing. And then, of course, we're going to be uploading everything onto our Sedona Wolf Week YouTube channel. And we can even post uh, answers there and a regular Wolf Week page. So we have lots of places that we can we can post that. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. We only have a, a few minutes left. Um, I didn't know if you had any parting comments or comments of hope or <laughs> anything you'd like to share with the village that's listening to you right now? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think I, I, I think the battle that's been going on in Washington has been very turbulent for everybody. And I think that the um, fact that the commission is now going to have to do rulemaking is a really positive step. And so everybody should stay tuned because that will be a full public process um, we don't know exactly when they're going to commence that because they recently discovered that not only might they have to do an environmental impact statement, they might have to do an economic impact statement, and that could take many months. So stay tuned for timing on that. You know, in Oregon, um, uh, some sad news recently, we've actually had two more wolf poachings in Oregon, and a number of groups have combined together to offer rewards towards finding the perpetrator and getting them uh, prosecuted and convicted, but this is certainly one of the other fears we will have with federal delisting that um, 
uh, that more wolves could be poached. So I would say for anybody who's living in a state that has wolves, get in touch with your agency right now and talk to them that um, that there were, um, find out what, what their anti-poaching program is, you know, find out who's running that and what you might be able to do to help uh, in terms of public education. Uh, signs out so that people know the difference between a wolf and a coyote during hunting season is also always a really good thing to invest in. Um, you know, in California, uh, the saga continues there. We were really excited. I, I don't think that I mentioned this in my talk. We recently learned that there were actually two litters born to the last in the pack. Um, there's a new male in the pack, and so he's not related to any of the females in the pack. So he bred the adult breeding female but he also bred her two-year-old daughter. And so each of those females, this is like a Yellowstone story, which is totally wild to have two litters in the same, in the same pack. But so the breeding adult female had at least five pups and the younger female had at least four pups. And uh, so we had you know, two really phenomenal events out of that. One is the pack size more than doubled just by the litter they had this year of at least nine pups. And two, two litters in the same pack. That's really pretty amazing. You know, I, I guess I would leave people with these words. You know, you think about the fact that when wolves were first listed in, uh, under the Endangered Species Act that was passed in 73, they were listed in 74. And at that time we had fewer than a thousand wolves and they were all just in Northeastern Minnesota. And today we've got 6,000 wolves, maybe a little more. And they're in various parts of the country. And we all know that's not good enough. We all know U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service needs to do a national wolf recovery plan, that there's lots more places for wolves, and we're all going to fight for that to happen. But please, please think about the fact that, that because of this fight that we have all been engaged in for so many years, we are bringing the wolf population up, and we're not going to give up, and we will continue to bring the wolf population up in number and expand it in range so wolves are in more places they used to be that they used to call them. Well, that is a fantastic ending to this presentation. I always continue to learn from you and I always appreciate you being a mentor to, for me and so many others. So with that, we're gonna say goodbye and please keep feeding us information. We will absolutely keep posting it on all our social media pages. Thank, Thank you, you so for the Wolf Village. <laughs> Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Amarok. I love her presentations. I love history. I love being kept up on what's really going on out there with somebody who's really got their thumb on the pulse. Um, thank you once again for all of your questions and all of your comments.